All right. <laughs> all right. Well, it's um happy to have a chance to talk with all of you in this very different format. And uh, I found that there are pluses and minuses to this kind of a, uh, a, a format for uh, any kind of online meeting. And um, I'm finding that the pluses outweigh the minuses, in my opinion. And so I'm kind of enjoying this, and I, I, I really like it. Before I uh, show what, what, what I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to show you a bunch of my watercolors um, on other screens that I'll turn to here in a minute. And then I'll get to the uh, video that I have to present. It's a two part video presentation. Uh, I use a, a, a um, service called Screencast-O-Matic and uh, they help me to format my videos so that I can put them on YouTube. And these two that I'm showing you, <clears throat> will be showing you are literally the only two that I have in the public domain on YouTube. Everything else is, uh, is unlisted and I use them for my classes, teaching my classes. And it's just a convenient place to store all the videos that I use for teaching and training of students. So I'll get to that. That'll be about 30 minutes worth of video for you to watch and I'll just mute the sound and then narrate as, as we go through the process and watch the painting unfold together. But in the meantime, let's get to the paintings, a little bit of slide presentation, if you will, and talk about paintings I've done in the past. And uh, like Roxanne said, feel free to ask questions through the chat bar and uh, uh, Roxanne will jump in with those as we go along. All right, so okay, I'm gonna move this. Okay, so I'd like to begin with uh, I kind of broke them up in it's sort of in in format. So here we have all vertical format paintings. Just thought I'd share them with you. But uh, this watercolor here is the most recent one, one of the most recent ones that I did down in. Um, uh, Capitol Reef National Park. These are the fruit eclipse. And I painted this for the um, the uh, Spring City Plein Air event down in Spring City in San Pete County back in August. Okay. So going from there to other, actually an older piece, this one right here, this is one of my personal favorite watercolors that I've ever done. I loved putting this little watercolor. It's just one of those that painted itself. And a couple of summers ago, three, four summers ago, <clears throat> I was showing it to my students and um, painting ended up missing. So I haven't been able to find it. <laughs> I don't know where it is, but anyway. This watercolor is from earlier this year from Utah's West Desert. The uh, gnarly old uh, um, Utah juniper trees. You can find an exposed uh, area of uh, branches and trunk like this. It's just so fantastic to paint. Really enjoy these. Roxanne, you know where this place is. Is it up Logan Canyon? Well, actually further north. Oh, Idaho Falls? <laughs> Cub, Cub River. Oh, Cub River, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is Cub River. I ran into Roxanne That's right. one time up there. We were both camping up there. And so uh, you know, this is uh, just a, uh, just right in the middle of the big campground at Cub River at, at Willow Flat. This is a painting from 2015. Um, this is in San Rafael country. This is at the bottom of uh, Buckhorn Wash in, in the San Rafael country and those mesas and buttes are just fantastic. Skies are cloudy and moody gave me a chance to really use some of the new pigments I was getting 
uh, exposed to and learning about, and that is the uh, the earth tones, the uh, uh, mainly the. Oh, I'm trying to think of the name of the color now, and I can't. Hematite. It's a it's a mineral that is actually mined right here in Utah. Daniel Smith has it ground up into a pigment and put in uh, a watercolor solution and uh, it just granulates so beautifully. So a lot of that sky is ultramarine blue and hematite. Oh my goodness. Yeah. These are stunning. This is a tree that um, is in Capitol Reef National Park and uh, uh, it's a little bit of a gut buster hike to get to it, but it's a beautiful, beautiful gnarly old tree. I'd like to find more like this one. Again, one of those Utah junipers that just gets that very aged and distorted look to it as it gets older and as it uh, gets baked by the summer heat in southern and central Utah. Here I want to share these two paintings right now, just side by side with each other. Same painting, different photographs, different lighting. Just an opportunity to share a little object lesson about lighting your work and lighting it properly. Um, and making sure that your light is not too warm or too cool, but make sure that it's natural light. And for the most part, I have found that the most, that the best light to shoot any and all artwork in is in the natural light of the sun. It gives you the most correct color for photographing your work. So I believe the one on the left was photographed in the sun. This one was photographed actually in the shade okay, of the sun, created a very cool look color temperature wise, not, you know, a cool look, <laughs> so to speak. This is a painting I did from a trip I took to with Plein Air Painters of Utah down to the uh, Vermilion Cliffs uh, in northern Arizona. Down here in the bottom, this is actually the cliffs dropping down to uh, Marble Canyon. And then these are the Vermilion Cliffs above, catching the last light of the day and taking photographs. It's no time to paint because light moves fast at that time of day. And so all I can do is take photos. But literally, that moment was gone in about three minutes. So. Summer Pines up in Huntington Canyon. Again, for Roxanne's benefit, this is from Willow Flat, Cub River. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the, uh, the trail up to uh, Old Witch Spring. It's the one on- uh, Willow, Willow Spring? Yeah, I think it's Willow Spring, the one on the right fork. Yeah. The left one is Peterson Spring, I think. Yeah. I anyway, that uh, little Cub River has these beautiful little falls. They're so fun to capture. All right. Now, most of these are actually pretty small watercolors. Uh, the first one I showed you is, a, is about a quarter size sheet, but most of these are about an eighth sized sheet of paper. And most of them were painted plein air, not all. This one of the state capitol was painted plein air. This one was not. This is actually a painting I did from a photograph that someone posted on YouTube, and I just love the image. And this is the oldest known uh, structure or house structure in France. Wow. And, uh, and it's just chewing gum and baling wires holding that together. And uh, I had a lot of fun painting it. Uh, 
this is actually quite a large piece. Um, commission for a friend. He and his wife walking in San Francisco. Alpine mountainside. This is actually a student piece of mine uh, when I was a student in Stephen Quiller's workshop back in, oh gracious, when was that? 2012, 13, I think 13, I'm not sure. I thought it would be fun to share this image here because what I like to do from time to time to check myself on how well I'm doing with color is I like to take a painting and turn it into black and white, or in this case, monochromatic brown tone, just to see how the painting works as value as compared with color. Sometimes as artists, we can get so caught up with color that we forget to think of color as value first so that the color can actually work best. And so that's what I did in checking myself. I did the painting and photographed it and then changed the photograph to black and white in order to see what that looked like. And I was pleased, I was happy with it. Any questions so far from anybody? I'm about to move on to another screen. Yeah, you're all muted. So if you have a question, just type it in the chat and I'll relay it to Tom. Okay. All right, on we go. This one, here, let me downsize it just a bit so that you can see it. Our thumbnails are kind of in the way there. But this is a painting I did again for the Spring City plein air event. And I, um, in Spring City, they let us go outside of San Pete County. We could go all over Utah. So I, again, I elected to go down to Capitol Reef National Park because I'm loving that place down there. I enjoy going. And I did this uh, piece looking up from my spot where I was sitting and uh, painting um, the bluffs and, and buttes uh, at the top of Grand Wash. Okay, I'll move that out of the way. Oh, wow. Pull this one in. This is a painting. Let's see. Yeah. This is a painting of an old spring shed. A friend of mine took me here one day in early June, a couple of years ago. And uh, there's a, <clears throat> inside the spring shed, the, the water is about two feet deep and it just bubbles up from the ground. And um, the local rancher there uses it to uh, water fields for pasture as well as to uh, water his cattle. And this is out in the middle of Utah's West Desert. So on the southern slope of the Sheep Rock Mountains. In fact, not far from this little oasis is the little Sahara sand dunes. So this is my small study for it. And this painting here is actually the large finished uh, watercolor, the almost a full sized sheet. I have a group of, I have a, a body of my watercolors, about 13 paintings that are on display. They've been there since uh, early July. And they'll be on display to the end of December at ANA Art and Frame in um, in Orem along State Street. Okay, we'll have to get that out. We do have a question. Do you remember what colors you used on the spring shed painting? All of them. All of them. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I have is a watercolor palette that is basically primary and secondary colors. 
So red, yellow, blue, primary colors, secondary colors, orange, green, and violet. But accompanying those colors, I also have a lot of pet colors. And the hematite color I told you about, that's one of those pet colors that, um, that, I, that I like to use. And um, so combination of all those colors, I mean, I went really blue with the shadows here in this piece. It just seemed to feel like it wanted to go that direction. And so that's what I did. Honestly, um, let's see this. Uh, let me adjust this properly. This watercolor here is probably more true to the actual colors of the scene. Yeah. Okay. Can I just ask what colors do you have like for that yellow? Let's see, I have a Hansa yellow, I have Cad yellow light, um, I have uh, a little bit of French ochre maybe mixed in with that. I have French ochre and I'm kind of using it up. I don't plan to get French ochre again. I find it to be just a little dull. I like the more vibrant colors and so um, yeah, I've been using French ochre, really just kind of trying to use it up. But a combination of, oh, just a whole plethora of colors are in the cab cabin itself. And um, I purposely let some greenish hues exist in the bottom parts of the cabin, those, uh, those uh, of the shed, you know, because there was a sense of, uh, uh, but being waterlogged and water soaked and and it can take on kind of a green tone to it as the mosses and molds grow and then up above where it was more exposed to the air it was drier so i painted more grays and purples and browns okay so yeah all right let's move along here this is from Capitol Reef National Park. Can't remember the name of the, of the Mesa, but it was uh, just a little further east on the main park road. This is a watercolor from the Strawberry Valley. Kind of a hidden valley, you have to you have to go down off of, uh, what is it, Highway 40 that goes east there across the Uinta Basin. <clears throat> I think it is. Yeah. Oh, it's nice, wow. Here we have a watercolor of a sunflower. So Tom, yes. how do you on that what how do you get the hairs on the on the sunflower? Mm -hmm. How did you get the hairs on the stem? So what I had to do is basically leave the white of the paper. Holy moly. And just uh, paint. So that's very much an example of positive negative space painting. Now I'll touch on that again in the video presentation in a little bit. But that's basically how those came together. Uh, I saw them uh, uh, as I was looking at it, and I used a admittedly unnaturally darker background behind the, the um, sunflower to help bring out those little spiny hairs along the stem, but also to help bring out the yellow of the sunflower. Consciously choosing a color in areas that went more towards the violet because violet is a complementary of yellow. And consequently, it helps the yellow to actually be a stronger, more intense yellow than if I were to have an analogous color like green uh, as its background. Rose. Self-portrait. Yeah. 
another version. Actually, my very first attempt at painting that uh, incredible Utah juniper that I found. And then here we have a uh, one of the big mountains north of Torrey. Love that. Love the face of that red cliff there. Wow. Okay, moving on to the next row. Here we have um, blue collar sunrise. This was literally looking right out to my front door. You can see the roofs tops of my neighbor's houses. This is a combination of acrylic and watercolor. I never would have done this had I not learned this again from Stephen Quiller. Okay. But as <clears throat> the artist can, as the artist uses acrylic in a very thin wash. And that's what I did when I painted the oranges and the yellows that you see. I could let that totally dry and re-wet it and go right over the top of it with watercolor, which is the blues and the violets and the browns. And I never once disturbed that orange and yellow underneath. Okay. And it was just beautiful combination for creating this particular painting. <clears throat> and he taught that in the workshop and I think some of us who were in the workshop might have forgotten that by now, but this is a nice reminder. Yeah. Okay. Another version <coughs> of that painting. Okay, and, and the yellow and the orange are your acrylic again. Oh, they're acrylic, and actually the pink is as well. Okay. Right up in here, the pink is as well. All the blue and the dark blue, the, the cerulean and the <coughs> indigo blue, those are, uh, those are watercolor over the top. Wow. That top of this uh, uh, butte, this mesa, was, was never that red, but it sure wanted to be while I did the painting. So that's how that color came to be. Wow. The vermilion cliffs, not so vermilion at this point, but uh, still great shapes and colors. This is a field plein air study of the uh, mountain peaks uh, of, of uh, the Wasatch Front above uh, Dimpledale Canyon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here in the Salt Lake Valley. Once in a while I do something besides landscape, but not very often. <laughs> canyon scene. Now this, I'll take this and pull it side by side with the other piece. Again, just to check myself, how am I doing on color? Well, the way of checking to see how I'm doing on color is to see what it looks like in black and white. And there you see the difference between the two. Um, this painting, oh gracious. I didn't even offer it for sale and someone asked about buying it. And um, I could have sold it three other times to individuals. And it's just one of those paintings again. That just, how, how big is it? Oh, it's a size, let's see, it's, um, I think the finished piece was about, well, it was on a 10 by 12 sheet of paper. I know that. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on to the next screen. All right, so just put in a little shameless plug here. January of 2021, the 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 
Plein Air Painters of Utah, in association with Sentient Academy, we're going to be putting on an event, an online event called Plein Air Utah Live. Usually we have our Plein Air Utah event in the fall in September in, uh, in Midway, but because of COVID-19, that's kind of put everything to one side in that regard. So we are uh, doing this online in 2021. And I'll be one of the presenters in that event. Uh, Becky Hartvigson will be a presenter in that event as well. And so will Roland Lee. We're all members of Plein Air Painters of Utah. And for anyone who might be interested, if you want to do a quick screen capture of it, uh, there's, the, um, there's the website. Uh, utahplanairlive.sentientacademy.com Okay, so I'm going to take this out and go on to the next piece. Hope nobody's in the middle of a screen capture while I do that. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. So I wanted, One more question. Yes. Uh, how much do you water down your acrylics? Pretty thin. Uh, pretty thin. I uh, basically about the consistency of a watercolor, a thin wash of watercolor. Uh, in terms of the concept of, of tea, coffee, milk, butter, uh, tea to coffee at best. Don't go milk or butter on with, uh, with it. It'll be, as long as the uh, acrylic can soak in to the paper's surface just a little bit, so that there's enough of uh, some fiber to grab a hold of the watercolor, the watercolor will hang onto the paper's surface just fine, even if it's being painted over acrylic. Okay? Okay. So this is uh, this photograph is showing my most recent little plein air setup, and I have a magnetic sheet at the bottom here, and then these two little cheap plastic pallets have magnetic uh, sheets glued to the bottom of them, and so they hold in the bottom of this pallet area of this paint box. And then up above here, uh, this is the the uh, easel portion. I set my watercolor there and I'm able to do the, uh, you know, the watercolor in the field. And so this is an example of how it works. Um, it, um, it attaches right at this point here. It attaches to what is the easel portion as opposed to the palette portion of this little setup. And what makes it possible, what makes this not fall down is because of these types of hinges right here. They are torque hinges. Torque, uh, they're, yeah, they're, they're called uh, torque resistance hinges anyway. Got a little nut on them, you can screw down and tighten the torque on them so that they don't uh, shift and flop on you, but hold what you want to hold steady and flat. So anyway, that's an example of that. So, and you made that, is that right? I made I made the uh, the planner box, yes, uh -huh. and I made it so it's interchangeable for both watercolor and oil paint. And then there's me and my wife after the fact, holding the painting that I did. So cool. we spent. Um, Oh, weekend, a couple week or a weekend or two ago up in Boise. We stayed at the Brunel Dunes State Park in a cabin. It's a beautiful time there. All right, so that's all I have to share on that front. It's time to move on to the watercolor demonstration. <clears throat> Any more questions coming in, Roxanne, before I get going? Not yet. Any other questions? Just chat, just send a chat if you have a question. <coughs> okay, let's get into the um, video <coughs> presentation itself for this, uh, for this demonstration. So 
<clears throat> the scene is Rush Valley. So these, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of went down the wrong throat there. These distant mountains are actually the Stansbury range of mountains. And then the valley in between is Rush Valley. These foothills that I'm standing in up here are the foothills of the Tintic Mountains. So I'm looking west, northwest. And this little low range of mountains right here is the Onaquai Mountains. And um, well, I'm a bit of a desert rat and I love going out here and painting. In fact, I'll be out there tomorrow morning for sure, painting. All right, so we're going to begin with the, um, with the presentation of the video. So just beginning with the drawing, so I thought I'd just show how I do the drawing work. Um, the pencil that I am using is a 0.5 millimeter lead pencil. Um, nice, thing I, nice thing about these kinds of pencils is you never have to sharpen the lead. So that's why I prefer them. Now, even though I'm drawing with pencil at this point, um, I will also be drawing with the watercolor once I get started uh, painting with watercolor itself. So whether you're drawing or painting, whatever tool you're using, as far as I'm concerned, in the end, it's all drawing. So that's what I hope that you keep in mind and I hope that is one takeaway that you take from this, the importance of developing drawing skill and using it as an artist. I have to tell you, I hate watching my own videos. I really do. I love the shadow of your hat. It was really needful, I'll tell you. Otherwise, it would have been washed out white and you wouldn't have been able to see a thing. And I realized that as I, as I got my uh, setup together is that I needed the hat in order to be able to record the painting itself. So I turned it upside down to start the painting in the sky. So my rule of thumb about painting is this uh, with watercolor and it has to do with the fact that I paint so much I paint the landscape so much so the rule of thumb is this light to dark top to bottom back to front and from general to specific so as I've turned it upside down I turned it upside down to paint top to bottom I've turned the top to the bottom to paint the bottom so I can turn it around and you'll see it as the top. And that's the sky. Uh, did that make sense? <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, I paint the sky first. I paint top to bottom first. What I like to do is paint in a manner that allows what I'm painting to be overlapped by what I'm painting next. And it feels logical in terms of helping the scene to feel like it's working in a logical manner. The top to bottom also is a way of keeping my own hand out of my work. So logistically, it's a, it's a factor. I started with uh, wet paint on a dry surface and then touched it with water to create the blending effect. Coming back in with more paint. Quick on question. Dry surface. Uh, what does recorded with screencast matic mean? Down in the left, left screencast matic is uh, just the service I use. 
and I use its uh, free version. So the logo is going to appear on my videos. If I were to pay for their service, I could get that logo taken off. So as it is, it's just it's just my uh, it's just the service I use for preparing my videos so that I can put them on YouTube. This right here, that's as accidental as it, as it was actually meant to be. It's the shadowed side of a cloud, okay? And, uh, but really it was as accidental as I actually planned it. So again, with watercolor, we do kind of keep in mind and have to work with what I've come to call, well, with, with what Bob Ross called happy accidents. So this is um, what I consider to be an example of uh, positive and negative space painting, relationship painting. I'm, I'm right now, I'm as much painting the snow-capped mountains of the scene as I am the exposed mountainside of the scene right now. So I'm painting one to make the other appear. And I was doing that as I was painting the sky the tops of the mountains appeared as I was establishing where the sky patterns were. And now I'm painting the bottom part of the mountains to create those snow-capped peaks. And that's that positive negative space relationship that I talk about. Now, the photograph that you saw in the beginning, um, <laughs> if you were to see that photograph side by side with the painting right now, you'd realize how much I'm not really painting precisely what I see. I'm painting the spirit of what I see. I'm painting the patterns. I'm working in some patterns that approximates what is there but it's not precise. You can't go mark for mark and say, oh, I know what that is. I know what that is. But it's the spirit of the place that is as important to me as anything else. When I watch an artist paint and they make a mark I don't understand, I find myself watching that area with real in, with great intensity. And maybe that's what you're doing with this spot right here. I'm really not painting uh, cast shadows just yet. This is Ill, this is all still just the um, snow-capped mountains against the exposed areas of the mountains, as this is uh, late winter, early spring.
I don't know if you noticed it, but while I was making that combination of strokes right there, it was sort of a dance move almost in terms of laying down marks and textures that were repetitious, but had variety to them. An important principle of design and composition is an idea known as, as repetition with variation. And uh, I actually try to keep that in mind sometimes in, in the pieces that I do, creating repetition, but giving it variety so it isn't boring. This combination of strokes right here, that's almost too boring. And I'm looking at it after, fact, after the fact, realizing that I'm not noticing that yet. <laughs> it's there, and during the painting process, I haven't seen it yet. So now I'm painting the valley floor. The patterns of the, of the dead grasses and the little bit of green starting to come forward that exists in that valley floor. When I look at the thumbnail, this actually is the palette that I was using as I did that particular painting. Okay. And as you can see, I never clean my palette. <laughs> And the reason why I don't is because watercolor reconstitutes when you touch it with water again. And all those stains in the mixing areas of my palette are just ready-made grays for me to be able to dip back in and start using them again. Now, for those who may have been a part of Stephen Quiller's workshop, uh, you may remember that he was constantly cleaning out his palette. And me, I love to I love to just leave a messy palette. In fact, my round palette of his, I have it somewhere right now, I'm not sure, but um, it's, a, it's a dirty palette too. It's a filthy palette, I don't clean it. I love all those grays that are there. Okay, maybe I'm starting to paint just a little bit of cast shadow now from the clouds that are roll, rolling over the valley floor, just knocking in some blues that are starting to indicate some cast shadows. So far, all I've been painting was just the, just the color patterns themselves. Now I'm starting to think light and shadow, light and cast shadow. So your values are more pronounced and your colors are more intense. As I come forward in the picture plane. Yeah. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Okay, we've jumped to the second video. And, uh, and that was a fast quantum leap. <laughs> <laughs> so um, now I'm uh, blocking in some of these shadow colors that are on the mountains, those blues in the snow, and it's starting to help the mountains to make a little more sense. I hope you're sensing that. It, um, 
helps them to feel like they have a little more depth to them than they did before. Cast shadow patterns from the sky. One of my favorite go-to brushes uh, lately, I kind of get new favorites every once in a while. That brush that I'm using is a low Cornell. And it's a 720 ultra round. Yeah, 720 ultra round. And um, a, a low Cornell? Has. What's that? Uh, would you spell that for those of us who want to? L-O-E-W hyphen Cornell. Thank you. Now we have a question. I'm going to go large on that. Okay, a question. When you put a value down, are you planning that it will be the final value for that shape area, or do you start light and build up your darks in layers? Typically, it's start light and build down with my, with my darks and my layering. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm so I'm typically going light to dark, which is the I uh, general generally accepted idea with a transparent watercolor. So I purposely changed to a flat brush as a way of introducing marks that are not all the evidence of that round ferruled brush and I wanted to cover a bigger area faster and that flat barrel brush helped me to do that. And one thing I like to do with some of my paintings is I like to leave evidence of the tool that made the mark. So there's something about these marks in here that leave a little bit of evidence that it was done with a flat barrel brush, a big flat as opposed to that round that I've been using all up in here. So If you watch my head, I'm looking at the palette, looking up at the scene, back down to the palette, that cast shadow bobbing back and forth, just uh, checking my subject, mixing the color, thinking and planning, scheming, failing, I mean, no, not failing. <laughs> So again, using the wet of the paper, now I'm just laying in the patterns that are in that uh, middle foreground of the, um, of the areas of sagebrush that are growing. So this is layering. You know, I've got those faded brown grasses from, that were grown from the previous year. And now coming in with the patterns of sagebrush and I'm letting that remain just as abstract as uh, I can make it, but yet trying to get the colors as close as I can. And then um, over the top of that, you'll see me putting in those middle and foreground patterns of the cedars and junipers that are growing. These marks are actually important because they help the scene to feel like now it's coming forward towards you, the viewer, as you're looking at the scene. Helps give a sense of the depth of space. We got a foreground, we have a middle distant ground, we, uh, a middle ground, and then we have that, those distant mountains. Okay, another question. Mm -hmm. um, what colors are you using to make sagebrush? Good question. That was a hard one to figure out for a number of years. 
uh, first, my recipe was simply uh, cerulean blue, yellow ochre, and cadmium red. With, uh, in the right combination, usually emphasizing the cerulean blue, it tended to look the most like sagebrush as I was mixing up the color. But I have found since then that uh, almost any kind of uh, grayish green that I add a touch of cerulean blue to uh, will turn into what I feel is sagebrush rather quickly and readily. So cerulean blue is kind of a central color, but it's heavily modified by other colors uh, to one degree or another. Uh, in order to give it that sage look and feel. So I've got these patterns of sagebrush and these darks that I'm putting in. It's actually an attempt to establish the underside of the sage as it's growing up from the ground level. You know, there's places where that sage is, it's got some depth to it. I'm to create, trying to create a sense of depth between the ground and the sage that's growing up from it. Okay, starting to work in some patterns of uh, the cedars and junipers that are growing. It, now, do, is your paper pretty dry at this point? Yeah, uh, through the process here, this is actually just uh, playing along in real time. It's, you know, when people ask me, how long does it take me to do a painting? It's the question I'm least able to answer. But lately, because of videotaping my work, suddenly I can start saying, oh, this took me 28 minutes, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So, but, uh, so through the process uh, with the sun shining and the breeze blowing, this is uh, drying up pretty good. And so it's going down fairly dry on the paper. Maybe there's areas where it's still damp and if I hit the, that area with some paint and it spreads a little, we need to remember that this is plein air painting so we don't worry about it, okay? Remember, happy accidents. That's all we have in watercolor, happy accidents, <laughs> especially if you're plein air painting. So, but I do have a second brush there. Now touch it with water and let it uh, kind of blend, let it kind of spread that color around and create those textures that to me start to say patterns of, of cedars and junipers. Some real foreground ones to block in there. One thing about plein air painting that I really enjoy is that it forces me to not noodle something so, um, so literally that it starts to almost die or be stifled because it's painted almost too well. Here, I'm blocking in the patterns of that cedar and uh, it's looking a little rough around the edges, but I'm okay with that.
Uh, what size are your low corneal brushes? So my sizes are basically a size two, four, I think I've got a six or an eight. Uh, I have my design students get size six and eight. Uh, my largest uh, low Cornell brush that I use is a size 14. Okay, that's probably a size 12 there that I'm using right now. And that's probably a size six on the brush I'm I'm you know, just using to add a little water and blend with. Let's see here. Oops. couple of new brushes I've been enjoying recently. These Princeton Neptune brushes. Okay. They've been very good to use. Here, what you're starting to see with these yellows and ochres going in, those are actually opaque colors. Some of my colors in the palette that I showed you a few minutes ago actually have a little white mixed in with them. Okay. And all of my colors have just a touch of honey mixed in with them as well. And uh, so I'm adding a little opacity to some of those uh, foreground trees just to add a little warmth and a variety of, of, uh, of uh, opaque versus transparent into the scene. helps to them to feel like they're coming forward in the scene before you as the viewer at your, as you're looking at them. Coming now down towards the end here. Now, usually in my watercolor demos, I take the board, my watercolor is on, I give it a spin, and let it fly out there and land somewhere out across the ground or the grass. My students always just gasp <laughs> when I do it, but it's just, it's just fun to do. I do it as a, I don't know, entertainment, <laughs> so to speak. You know, I think if I had this painting to do over again, I might add a touch of red somewhere. Put in a little punch of red, just a little bit. Okay. Where would you put it? Uh, I don't know, but here we have, let me move this. So here we have the, the, the painting finished and done. And uh, so that's what it looks like. And Colleen Reynolds purchased this piece, bless her heart, love her dearly. And uh, yeah. Well, she's lucky. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very beautiful. All right. Well, that is this evening's presentation. That's the whole dog and pony show. That's all I got. I'm spent. <laughs> so I'm going to unmute everybody so they can tell you thank you. And Okay. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Sorry, you guys. I'm Thanks, Tom. Huh? Great job. What what pa paper surface did you use? Let's see, this I believe was Arches, um, yeah, Arches 140 pound. 
Uh, I'm also using a lot of um, Blick paper these days. I really like Blick. I think it's a wonderful uh, cost effective, cost alternative to Fabriano paper. I think it behaves a lot like Fabriano and it's not as expensive. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a brand that I've been using lately. I do have a lot of, of Fabriano. I have some, uh, oh gracious, uh, Wachman paper. I've got uh, uh, Saunders Waterford. That's a tricky paper. Yeah, Waterford. Yeah. Thank you. Is it cold press? Uh, most all of them are cold press. I do have some hot press paper, but I can use the hot press for drawing. Yeah. Any other questions? Lots of thank yous on the chat. Thank you to all of you for. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Tom. That was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, that was absolutely fantastic. And I agree with Julie, I needed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very, very nice. Hope it serves, hope that it, hope it inspires, and I hope that uh, you get out there and paint. And uh, don't worry about how good or bad you do. Just get out there and do it, because you're not going to get any better if you don't do it. Okay. So, yeah. It's a good warm up for next Friday. Yeah, good warm up. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, going out and painting tomorrow will be in preparation for next Friday. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Friday. you guys, you know that Tom's teaching a workshop for us the twenty and twenty first, uh, fifty dollars, and it will be uh, four Zoom sessions, and it's going to be very nice. I'm signed video. up for it, and I'm excited. Video presentation, video critique video presentation, video critique. That's kind of the format that I've uh, sort of envisioned to put together for that. Nothing pre-planned for a painting? Well, yeah, I will be showing a video just like this and then uh, narrating it as we're watching it. So we will be doing that. And then you'll have options to uh, paint the image itself. I will email it to those who are in the workshop and uh, let you uh, um, uh, work on it yourself and then I can give you feedback on it. Okay. Yeah. Can we, uh, so could we paint along with you or is that kind of what you had in mind? Actually, I, I didn't envision a paint along. Okay. I have a little trouble with those because um, I find that people sometimes uh, uh, get a little frustrated in, in a process like that with a paint along. Okay. I like to really show and illustrate and let you see for yourself the whole process as, as I go through it and then let you go from there and work on your own. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. All right, any other comments or questions or? Yeah. All right. Uh, I, you guys, this is recording, recording. Um, so now I will try to figure out how to get it on YouTube, but it is recorded, so. Wonderful. Uh, wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> but I will, I will uh, get it done. So, okay. You help with that, Roxanne. I might be able to talk you through it up. Okay, that'd be good. That'd be good. All right. Okay, any other questions? If not, I will uh, end the recording and we'll tell everybody goodbye, all right? Thank you. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you everyone, have a great